Education was relatively important to the Pennsylvania German settlers who came into our area. Not very important for most of them, but girls learned how to read so that they could read the Bible to their children. Boys would learn how to read and write and do numbers so that they could do calculations in business in later life. But for the first decades it was relatively unimportant and most of the schooling was either done at home or done uh, by, by schoolmasters or by pastors in local churches. Although there were a few schools that were built in the 1700s and the 1790s in Centerville, which was the old name of East Mukunji. There was a school there that hired a, a schoolmaster, a male schoolmaster, and there was one in what became East Texas, which was a semi-formal school. It was a building with a teacher, and there were other gatherings in local homes where students would learn how to do the necessary but not, the, not what we would think today as the essential worldwide knowledge that our students should have. In the 1830s, things began to change somewhat. There was a school act, a free school act, passed in 1834 by the state legislature, but it came with a local option. And that meant that your local municipality could vote down subsidizing local private local schools for the students and that's in fact what happened in Laura McCunchy Township. They, um, the folks that could afford to send their kids to school sent their kids to school and they paid privately for that uh, but they didn't want to pay for other people's children. Why would they pay for other people's children? The importance wasn't there because people went on to work on the farms. They were laborers. They didn't need to know very much. However, in 1859, the voters in Lower Mukunji decided to vote for the Free School Act, and they then began to get state subsidies, not large ones, but some state subsidies, and to tax their property to pay for schools. The reason that property was taxed, rather than anything else, was there was no, people did not have incomes. People, there was no other way to get uh, money out of people other than establishing the value of their property and basing the tax on that. It wasn't a heavy tax, but it was it was enough to pay for a few schools. Uh, at first there weren't very many of them, and at first there were only male teachers, and at first the schooling was only for four months a year, and students would be on the farm or in their father's workshops the rest of the year. Female teachers had been hired, uh, they were not paid as well as the men teachers, as you can imagine, and if they got married, they had to stop teaching. Um, the uh, male teachers were paid about $20 a month. It's gradually increased, but not. It, they still could be paid less. If a schoolhouse, for example, had to be built, there was only so much money to go around, and the teachers would have to take a cut for that year which made it very difficult for good teachers to come in because they, the good teachers wanted to go to the local academies. And there were academies in Makanji, Emmaus, Allentown. There were places where you could go and get uh, a much more rigorous education. Most of the teaching, if not all of the teaching in the local schools was in Pennsylvania Dutch at the time uh, that the schoolhouses were built. Schoolhouses started to be built after the Civil War and they were brick-built houses to replace the log and frame-built houses that had been there before. Uh, they were based on patterns that the, that the State Department of Education provided to local school districts so that it would be affordable for school districts to go ahead and do this kind of thing. They could make minor adjustments to the designs, which almost all of them did, of course, uh, but they didn't have to go and hire a, a builder um, to come up with a brand new design for each school. Most of the schools here in Lower Mukunji initially were one-room schoolhouses and obviously just had one teacher, but there were a few that had two rooms, West Coastville, eventually um, one in East Texas, and eventually Hartzell's, which was in Mine Site, which was a thriving community uh, in the late 1880s, 1890s that had a two-room schoolhouse, but most of them were the one-room schoolhouses that we still see today. Most of them are still standing and most of them are recognizable because they're based on the state patterns. 
It wasn't until 1911, in fact, when education had to switch over completely from Pennsylvania Dutch to English. Much of the teaching gradually became in English because it was the language or one of the main languages of commerce. Until the 1950s, consolidation started in the local schools by combining um, classes so that fourth to eighth grade would be in one schoolhouse and uh, the first, the elementary students would go to another schoolhouse and busing took the students from place to place. Um, the school district in Lower Makanji had several sub-districts initially and each one had a schoolhouse built in it so that the students would not have to walk certainly more than two miles, but in most cases no more than one mile to school. Um, by the 1870s, 1880s, they were going to school all of five months a year and much of it was in the winter time when there was not so much work to be done on the farm. And they would go daily, not for a very long day, they would have, they would take their lunch with them. When I started school for second grade, I had to walk from our front door to East Texas, where the two-room school was. We walked about a mile across the fields. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, when I lived in Brookdale, I walked. There were no buses. Anybody who had a car and picked you up, there was no problem. They would not harm a child. I wasn't crazy about school the first year or two. And then when I had to walk that distance, I, I learned to love school, every bit of it. And that's why I walked to Allentown and to Rob Junior High. You know, I thought because I was just a, a farmer's daughter, it, it wasn't in the cards for me to learn everything that I did. But once I started, I, I couldn't get enough. So I walked. Which was a short walk for students back in those days, except maybe in the winter, which was the primary school year. Uh, they would have a break in the middle of the morning for a snack. The desks were an approved better design, a state approved design. The windows were much larger than they would have been on the smaller early schoolhouses. And maps and blackboards and um, slates would have been introduced so that the students could learn more efficiently than just by copying on old scraps of paper. Uh, they um, learned mostly at this time still some English because English was, uh, was needed, uh, but most of the teaching was in Pennsylvania Dutch. The early teachers, I'm told, used to encourage their students to speak a little bit of English, and many of the students would come to school with some English, some would come to school with no English whatsoever. This became a problem after 1911, when a Pennsylvania School Act required all education to be in English, all books to be in English, and the dialect not to be taught at all and not to be used at all. But the teachers were sympathetic and they, they would use the dialect to help the children along, especially those who started out with no English whatsoever. My parents were bilingual, but they didn't want us to speak a Pennsylvania German or the mm -hmm. dialect. Well, there were very few kids that uh, uh, spoke only a dialect. I don't really know any of them. Uh, they all were bilingual. As I was, uh, because their parents uh, spoke English at home. Uh, they spoke the dialect when they were talking to each other, parents, or to neighbors. And when we got to junior high school, kids there uh, put us down because uh, if you're a Pennsylvania German, you have probability a uh, problems with uh, pro pronouncing B's and W's. Miss uh, Golden was uh, the elementary teacher. They uh, first to fourth grades. And Mr. Stetler was the um, fifth through eighth grade teachers. And they were both of the finest, I would say, of all the teachers that I've met in my life. And I was a teacher for 35 years. Uh, they were probably the best prepared 
and uh, they um, the best role models. We had no music at all except for opening exercises. We sang out of a little um, book called the Book of Golden Song. There's a lot of Stephen Foster in there. So the most fun we had at opening exercises would have been to sing Brown song, like Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Dealings with art and no library. We had no library, only the, the, the textbooks. We had no music teacher or anything like that. Did you play an instrument? I did, but just to help myself. <laughs> what did you play? Piano. Uh -huh. We did sing songs every morning cool. and said the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I remember being in a Laura McCungie chorus. We had a spring concert. Mm -hmm. We didn't have no swimming class or anything like that. <laughs> or no uh, library or anything like that. Oh yeah, you know, they had to bring in coal, straighten the room out, help the teacher just about every day. We had to go in carry coal up there. That was the, the we, buckets of coal we had to bring up from the uh, basement. Oh, yeah. I, everything uh, was done on a shoestring in the school district where uh, Mr. Marks uh, organized the Laurel Band Bible class and they met for the first several years of their organization in the school. Oh, yeah. And they put electricity in the school. They had electric oh, lights, but they, never, they were never turned on for us. Oh. On the darkest day, so they couldn't afford it. This is during the Depression. No air conditioning. <laughs> I know we had no drinking water in the school, so uh, well, I think for a time we had a bucket that we'd fill at the pump, which was uh, fed by the cistern from the roof, and uh, that had to be cleaned every year. We had a pump and pump water and brought it into the hall. Where they brought the carried the water from the neighborhood. Yes, we did. Carried cold, carried water. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. There was no plumbing, no heating. Oh, no indoor, not at home or at school. The water we had in school was we had a, out front, there was a, a cistern with a hand pump in the front then. Mm -hmm. Later on, when they play Halloween jokes, they take the pump handle off and hide it. <laughs> Very primitive. Uh, a two-seater toilet with uh, a place for urination in, uh, in the uh, side. The girls' toilet was simply a two-seater on the other opposite side of the playground mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. Uh, it cleaned out once a year by uh, uh, a neighbor maybe and put on his fields. Yeah, we didn't even have to flush and they used to sort of lay the, the odd houses over sometimes too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a, a stove, big round belly stove that uh, the boys usually tended because uh, boys were big husky things who worked on farms and if the farmer felt like he needed help at home he would keep that young man home and uh, that meant uh, that day's lesson would probably never sit with him because they like farming better than learning. <laughs> Uh, one of the stories I like to tell is uh, our teacher was Mr. Yoey, and Mr. Yoey had a farm, and uh, he had a farmer living on the farm, and uh, we used to take a week off during potato harvest, help harvest the potatoes. We didn't have new things, but Mother would make me a new dress, twice as good because my mom put everything in it, you know. She, uh, she sewed especially good. She had a sewing machine. Not too many people had sewing machines. Whenever she made anything, you could see it was Maggie's work. Well, all through my years, all girls had to wear dresses, no slacks, no jeans, nothing. But in, in uh, the senior year, and this was not me, but a girl in my class came in with jeans. That was a no-no. She was sent immediately to the principal, uh -huh. her parents called, she went home. So they were very strict about the dress code. Now we, we, we jumped rope and we 
shot marbles. I, I was a tomboy. I, I played with the boys. Baseball and marbles. And When we uh, couldn't go outside to play, why, one of the things that we had, the windowsills were a wide, old-fashioned wide, windowsill it was almost as big as this table you know it's about and there we used to sit there and uh, stand there and play jacks I <laughs> uh, was responsible for cleaning the area around the desk at, uh, at the end of the school day I do remember clapping erasers together the neatest was that Christmas time as a present for our teachers the people on the farms would bring in live poultry and we would take a collection of uh, pennies and nickels and dimes to pay for uh, a turkey or a duck or a goose or some pigeons. Uh, and then we'd, on the day before the holiday, these would be released in the room and there was pandemonium so they were caught. <laughs> and then they went back into the uh, uh, teacher's bag and he took them home and put them in the pot. And I thought that was neat. And uh, I think the jolliest day we had in school was a cleanup day on, in May. We scrubbed the school. We brought water in, scrubbed the floors. What was a, a, a freezer of ice cream, homemade ice cream, for those kids that came to help the cleanups. By the 1950s, schooling had changed dramatically. Many of the students were in schools that just had a few grades, and they would be bused or taken by car. Uh, by people who were hired to move them from one school to the next so that they wouldn't have to be in one school with eight grades. They could be in a school with four grades. There were several two-room schoolhouses that were that had high standards of education and if you were to see the eighth grade examination that was offered and we have a copy in the Laura Mukunji history book you would see that these students were learning a very substantial amount of knowledge and they were reading well, and they were doing some very difficult arithmetic problems. The county exam, uh, they write the uh, exam, and it was, that, that preceded the, all the testing that's going on today. The teacher, I think, pretty much uh, was uh, rated on how many kids he could get through that exam. And so they worked very hard. They would keep us after school uh, for the uh, several weeks before the exam to go over old exams to tell us exactly what was going to go uh, into the, uh, the new one. In the 1950s, there was more and more pressure to have high schools. Lower Makanji didn't seriously consider introducing a high school at this time. It had been sending its students to Emmaus and to Allentown as tuition students uh, by trolley. Some of them, of course, walked if it was to Emmaus. And this was, this was all right until the state pressured the uh, school districts to start up their own high schools. Lower Makanji and Emmaus and Makanji banded together initially, Albertus also, and built uh, the first Emmaus High School that would take students as part of a district instead of just Emmaus students with some of the tuition students coming in. This was the East Penn Union School District, which was created in, in 1952, soon after Upper Milford joined, when they saw the advantages of having uh, of consolidating with a larger region. As the new high school was where the Emmaus High School is today, but not as large, and that tract was considered so large that they would never need anything more than that. A family vacation, the nearest thing I can think would be a holiday where you were a lot company. But I lived across the street from the school and there was a playground there. Mm -hmm. And so I spent all my time there, except the time when I walked, I walked down to Cedar Beach, it was about a mile and a half to swim. It was free in those days. We played basketball. I had roller skates, but they were the old-fashioned clip-on ones that uh -huh. would fall apart. I love roller skating up in the barn, which isn't there anymore. We did, oh, we did sleigh riding and bike riding. I love bike riding. Two sisters and I used to go out in movies and things like that. We went to Dorney Park a lot, and we were crazy about the, the roller coaster. Going to Dorney Park, 
I started going to Dorney Park every weekend when I was 14. Oh, yeah, I had household chores. I, washed, I started washing dishes when I was seven years old. I used to walk home from school, yeah. pick potatoes. We fed the chickens. Mm -hmm. We watched the cows out in the meadow. Um, we watered the cows and the horse. There were things we had to do. Yeah. Bring in the coal, bring in the wood, take mm -hmm. out the ashes. Yeah. No, we lived on the farm. We were busy on the farm. And sports, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I read the potatoes. Uh -huh. And I uh, pick, pick, pick potatoes, yeah. In my high school time, my dad farmed me out to this uh, gentleman here. So I worked on the combine. That wasn't so bad. No. My buddy, I got to know, that worked for him as a hired hand, stayed there. Right. He worked on the baler. Uh, well, <laughs> that's a dirty job. Those are hard. Yeah. You even worked harvest the corn then, too. Yeah. Well, I was the one who tended cows so they wouldn't go in the corn. And I only left them go in the corn once. But we ran around a lot in the farm, I'll tell you.